Hello, everyone. Happy February. <laughs> it is here. We are here in um, February already. Um, welcome, 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 everyone. As always, I'm really happy to have you all join me. Thank you so much. I love it. Hello, some faces I haven't seen in a while. Cheryl, how are you? Very exciting. So anyway, I kept a couple of quirks and you know, it's, it's fun. I'm sure all of you have done this before. You probably all pulled corks out of your bottles and noticed that not all corks are the same. So it's just a little, you know, it seems like, um, it seems like a, a not big deal to think about, but when it comes down to it, this little puppy is what really, really defines your wine as it ages over time, right? Um, and so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about. And there's, and there are different kinds. So I know it's hard to see right now, and this is totally useless because I feel like showing things on the Zoom screen is like, 100% useless, but I have two different corks right here and two different styles. One looks like a little, um, almost like a mosaic, right? And then the other one is just pretty, pretty clean and just regular cork. So we're going to talk about what the difference between these two are in particular today, which is kind of fun. Um, and then also some of you, uh, for example, if, if you have uh, bourbon, uh, <laughs> You may be using a synthetic quirk, also totally fine. So um, these are all all things that we're gonna we're gonna chat about. All right, I don't have anyone in my waiting room right now, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started, so you guys can all continue to enjoy your evening. But continue um, if this is anyone's first time. Welcome, I'm Sasha. It's a pleasure to have you here. And if you have any questions at all, throw them in the chat in the chat box because I'm I'm usually very good at um, you know following that along. And in the, for now, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the, with the little class presentation. So that's great. So yeah, we're talking about cork today. Um, so that wonderful, wonderful thing that keeps you <laughs> the only thing between you and your wine, which I think is hysterical, although that's so not true. There could be other things, you know, it could be like um, a spouse or something, who knows. Uh, so cork, what is cork? Um, when we talk about cork, of course, we are talking about a natural material. Uh, that's used as a closure for wine bottles. And as we've just discussed already, uh, it's also, it's not exclusive to wine bottles. Cork is used in many other, um, in many other uh, drink beverage uh, closures. Uh, it's used for purposes other than bottle closures as well. But primarily as we'll talk about, it is really, um, the industry is really focused around the wine bottle and wine bottle closures. Um, so cork itself, I just mentioned it, but it has it direct uh, directly contributed to the evolution of bottle aging, and that is because and when we talk about this, this is a as an organic product. Um, when you put this in the wine bottle, it has the ability to be uh, to be completely watertight, so that your 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 wine will not leak out. But there is just the opportunity of a little bit of oxygen ingress into the bottle. So when you close your bottle, um, when the wine is bottled at the winery and the stopper is placed in there, you know, there's a little bit of ullage, there's just a touch of it, a wee, wee, wee little bit of air that's captured in the bottle, and then you put the cork in. And over time, that of course is going to allow a little bit more oxygen into that air pocket uh, very, very, very slowly. And it only comes in contact with that little bitty part of the wine bottle or the wine inside of the bottle. So it's a very, very extremely slow process of oxygen that actually allows the wine itself to develop those tertiary aromas and flavors that we, we kind of, or I should say most of those tertiary aromas and flavors that we associate with bottle age. So, um, and this is a really, a really important component to appreciating wine and to how and why we drink wine, which is, you know, just really, really interesting, I think, to keep in mind and to know. And then um, with the, uh, you know, advances in both science and winemaking. I mean, we're also talking from the beginning of time, right? <laughs> so when we talk about cork, uh, you know, the evolution of the cork has been really, really interesting. It has had a, a lot of, um, it has had a, prog a progression, right? Uh, cork, uh, we'll talk about like where it comes from and sort of what the origins of it were, but you know, uh, as, as time has gone on, it's turned out that kind of sometimes scientific and winemaking advances has sort of, uh, pushed the cork itself out of the way, and they've had a little bit of a tiff sometimes. So um, there's been uh, slight battles between the the world of the cork and the world of the wine, as it were. So 
Um, that is just a part of the natural evolution of developing the cork and its uses, which in wine and other uh, elements. But regardless of, um, of everything that's gone on within the wine world, the cork, the cork itself is still the most important um, wine bottle closure and the most popular closure for wine uh, today. Uh, I wanted, I, I know I've mentioned this before in other things, I've gotten it wrong, but I, I must make sure I looked it up. So it's another fun fact about cork in French. Uh, cork is le bouchon. Um, and that is also the same word that's used for traffic jams. So I, I learned that from Nancy actually while we were driving <laughs> out of Paris, I'm pretty sure in a traffic jam. And she told me all about that. Uh, so, but also um, the word for mouth is la le bouche. So um, not the same word, I've gotten that mixed up before, but you know, close enough. Uh, so the cork, le bouchon go and le bouchon uh, is the cork in the bottle. And it's also the cork in traffic that stops you up. So. Fun fact about French, yay. Um, so wine closures overall, this is the important part about wine closures. We have got, you know, they're necessary. You can't really, you can't make wine and just leave it out, of course. You have to have something to seal the vessel in which that wine is being held. Now, why? Because as we just talked about, exposure to oxygen is the process by which your wine will become vinegar. So they've known this for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and this is like pre-Roman pre, pre into the Greek era, the Egyptians, they knew that you had to cover the wine, otherwise it would go bad. And they had various ways of doing this. Um, many times it included uh, wax seals, sometimes cloth as well. But even as early as the Greek times, they were, they were aware of cork and they used cork as one of those natural stoppers for the amphora that they would um, that they would hold their wine in. Uh, they would oftentimes seal that with wax. So this is a, because, you know, cork is itself, as we said, has come a long, long way. It is not, uh, as you can see from any cork that you have, it's not exactly solid. You'll notice there's kind of like little imperfections in there, little, little air pockets potentially. So early in the way, way back time in the Greek and Roman times, you know, you put the cork in there, it does a pretty good job of stoppering up you know, most and preventing most of that oxygen ingress, but there's still going to be something that can get through and or, you know, alternatively, you can tilt it over and some wine might leak out. So that wax seal is what helps to secure the, the seal itself of the wine uh, inside of the bottle through the closure. Uh, and again, this has also been done with uh, by sticking a cloth in there as well to kind of put the cork in over the cloth to create that extra layer of seal for the for the wines itself. Um, but they have uh, and pitch. I shouldn't say I shouldn't say just wax, but also pitch as in tar, which is fascinating, right? Um, so the uh, interestingly enough, while this was in use in early times during the medieval period, it kind of fell off. Like so many things, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire really kind of threw everything into the Dark Ages, uh, and during which time wine was still being produced, but it was primarily the production of the church. And during this time, you had a lot of, um, you know during the, um, they were, they've tended to move back towards the, um, the use of wooden cloth during the Middle, e Middle Ages. And they just, the, the non-use of cork, I should say, they believe came from the fact that during that time and during the eighth century, uh, especially, you had the Moors that had taken over the Iberian Peninsula. And so since Spain, which we'll talk about, was one of the primary sources for cork, that wasn't making its way to Europe. Uh, and so therefore they were finding alternatives. And at this point too, uh, the barrel itself became one of the most popular forms of storage for wine, as opposed to the clay amphora that had been used into the in the Roman and German and Greek times. Um, so the the barrel itself has its own stopper, which is the bung, which is really kind of just like a cork, but it was they would just use wood on wood for that, with a little bit of cloth in the meantime. Um, but so this you know went on and it, it was fine, it was suitable, it kept their wine drinkable. Um, but during the 17th century is when we came across glass and the the production of glass bottles. And glass bottles required a totally different kind of closure. They had to innovate more. And at first they started using glass in glass, glass stoppers. And this is to this day a very common uh, closure for decanters, right? So you have glass in glass. It works very well. Of course, uh, you know, glass is breakable. Um, and glass is also expensive. So uh, ultimately what happened was they went to uh, the you know, they basically started going back to cork. They sort of reverted to that. They perfected the evolution of cork. And also uh, eventually, um, you know, they used, to, they used to just tie it with a string. You'll still see that sometimes. Um, but you also have a, you know, the fact that 
originally why they didn't use cork and why they used the glass stoppers was because you needed something to get the cork out of the bottle. So the cork then became popular once they invented the corkscrew, which is really, really a critical environment um, for you know getting the wine out of the bottle once you put the cork in. So where does cork come from? Uh, cork comes from a tree. Cork is the bark of the Quercus suber, which is actually within the oak family. So it's a, a very a sort of newer uh, species of oak, and it has this extremely thick bark that allows the bark to be stripped from the tree without harming the tree. And this is super critical because if you know anything about trees and their bark, if you were to take, uh, and most trees, if you were to strip a ring around the trunk of the tree, you essentially prevent it from being able to transport nutrients to the top portion of the tree and eventually it can die. You severely cripple the tree by doing that. But this particular species, Quercus suber, uh, does not have that deficiency. So what it does is it creates this bark sort of continuously and it's able to be harvested. So the ideal conditions for the Quercus suber are, uh, you know, they need, they like sandy soils with not a lot of chalk. They need moderate rainfall, like 15 to 30 inches. So fairly, fairly sufficient, but they really need good weather. Like it can't get um, below 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it needs to stay, uh, you know, your average altitude above sea level, you know, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 feet. So there's a very specific range in which this tree likes to grow. And the ideal places for that are are actually Spain, North Africa, and Portugal. Very, very popular for that. Um, the actual cork industry as we know it was birds in Catalonia, but it was un ultimately during the Spanish Civil War kind of truncated, uh, unfortunately. And Portugal really took over the mantle. So uh, the, the most, Portugal is, uh, it, it has about 34% of the world's cork trees. It is definitely the powerhouse of cork production. Um, and so Portugal is really kind of the mainstay. It's part of a huge part of their economy as well. But you still have significant forests that are in um, Spain. You also have uh, cork forests, although not high levels of cork production uh, within Italy uh, in also, um, Sardinia, uh, Corsica, and along the Mediterranean coast. And actually, they've done some, uh, so Nick is asking why they can't, don't grow in California. They are trying, there are some trial plantings within California, within Japan as well, but it's just a lot of, uh, it's a lot of, uh, you know, it's a viability because when we talk about this, uh, as the next I'm going to say right here, you know, it, you have to wait 25 years for that cork to be actually uh, useful. So that tree has to uh, wait 25 years. So if this is all, um, if this is all the, you know, the idea that you have to wait that long for the forest to produce it, you know, these trial forests are gonna take some time to pick up and they simply just don't have the history and the expansiveness of the sort of European, Portugal and Spain since those have been going on for such a significantly longer time. And there are very, very established industries really, but they can be grown in other places. It's not just there. Uh, Therese is asking if I'll cover this, but if there, is, there, there was talk of a cork shortage. I'm not actually gonna talk about that, but um, I will, uh, I'll follow up with that in the, in the email as I follow up with everyone after this. So sorry about that, but it's just not in this presentation. <laughs> but the other idea is that, yeah, so you have to wait 25 years, which is significantly longer, for example, than you have to wait for a grapevine to produce viable grapes. Um, but once you get those producing, uh, you know, you can, you can harvest them year after year, different with cork trees. Uh, so while you have to wait 25 years, you harvest them once a year, but actually you harvest them uh, not once a year. In Portugal, they actually have a rule, they have to wait uh, every nine years so that the bar can sufficiently grow back. So there's also that kind of idea. You have to have a significant amount of acreage uh, in order to produce a significant amount continuously. So um, that is probably partially what had to do with that, with the shortage. Um, but I actually, yeah, I don't have that. I don't have that information. I'll have to get that to you. Sorry, Therese, but I will look that up. Um, and the other thing is important to know is that these, in most of these countries that we're talking about, Portugal, Spain, even Italy to some extent, you know, this is a part of the, the this is subsidized by the EU, specifically in Portugal. Um, it's part of, again, the government really, really is heavily involved in this because it's such an important part of the economy of the country as a whole for all of these. Um, and then it's interesting because, uh, you know, the expect the average life expectancy of a cork tree is 170 years and that's massive. So when you think about that, that's such a long time that you can continuously, I mean, not continuously, but let's say every nine years, you're getting a solid, you know, 
at least almost uh, 18 harvests out of that, right? So over time, that's pretty significant. Um, there is, and, and they produce quite a bit. Uh, so there's an acre or two and a half acres of uh, cork, and I actually talk about this later, two and a half acres of cork forest will produce about 500 pounds of cork. And when you see about how light these things are, you can imagine like that's a lot of cork right there. But they talk about there's actually the oldest cork tree is in Portugal and it's a single tree that's 200 years old. Um, and it alone produces like 800 pounds or not 800 pounds, um, or no, it's, a, it's 1600 kilograms of cork when it's harvested because as the cork trees get older, they actually produce more cork. So uh, the older they get, the more you get out of them. So it's really valuable to hang on to them for a really long time. So the properties of cork that make it really, really useful for stopping up our wines and among other things, it actually has this incredible microstructure, these uh, sort of um, they're tiny, tiny cells, about 14 sided usually, and they undergo a process, which is, this is a crazy process name, it's called suburinization. And I looked this up to try and get the specifics about what happens, because you know I'm geeky like that, but there's really no kind of <laughs> explanation of what exactly um, the process of suburinization is. What you do understand is essentially the outcome of suburinization. Um, and this is the resulting features of cork, which make it sort of light, very, very light and elastic right there's almost that rubbery quality to it there's a flexibility there's a, a spring to it um, and it also um, part of that process it makes it inert so you know it doesn't give off gases it doesn't it doesn't affect other materials around it it is considered inert much like stainless steel is inert and then you have a, a, a product which is also while being flexible light and inert impermeable to gases and, uh, and liquids as well, which is again, why it's a really, really excellent closure for bottles in which you have to deal with that, right? Um, so the other thing of cork, cork has a low conductivity. So you use it, I mean, that's great for, we have tons and tons, cork is always kind of on the bottom of hot things, right? You're, uh, you're uh, for, for pot holders in the middle of the, of the table to protect your table, wonderful you've got that there. Uh, it's also used oftentimes in automotive parts. We've seen it used for many, many things, but even though it's within a ton of different industries, it's still primarily, primarily used for, uh, for in the wine industry and for stopping wine bottles. So the way that cork is processed is essentially the cork bark is usually stripped during the summertime. And if you're in Portugal, that'll be once every nine years. Um, and then again, here it is, one hectare or 2.5 acres can yield up to 500 pounds of cork, which is really, really impressive. Um, oh no, I have it here, it's in my notes. Uh, yeah, the, the 200 year old, the 200 year old um, uh, cork tree in Portugal is actually, uh, it yields 1200 kilograms, which is roughly, I think, about 500 pounds from a single stripping from a single tree, which is pretty, pretty intense. So that's really awesome. Um, and when you go to Portugal, if you want to check out <laughs> the, the cork forest, most of them are in Alentejo, sort of that southern region of Portugal. But a lot of the production, the cork production itself, happens right outside of the Douro. So that's a really interesting kind of opportunity to go there and visit kind of these factories, because ultimately the main, um, the main viability and quality of the cork is more determined in the processing procedures than it is in the forest itself. So once the cork is stripped, essentially, interestingly enough, very much like the staves of wine barrels. You have to season the, the cork stripped bark out in the open air. So this does a few things, of course, right? It dries it out and it removes excess moisture. This is imperative for the prevention of any molds or any kind of fungus that can grow in these little openings and these little air pockets of the cork itself. And that is doubly important for wine because those little, any kind of mold or moisture within the cork itself can ultimately be a factor leading to cork taint, which we'll talk about later. But you have a minimum of six months where it's seasoning outside. Uh, and then interestingly, you know, the corks are punched out of the strips perpendicular to the tree growth. So if you're looking at the, the sort of picture right here and you see the cork, you know, they're cutting off, they're basically, uh, on that skinny end, that's where they're punching the corks out, right? So you really only have that much room for a cork, which is ultimately why there's only a, you know, most corks are roughly around the same kind of size. 24 millimeters is usually the norm. Some are a little bit bigger, some are a little bit smaller, but much bigger than that. And you can't actually use a single piece of cork for it. So the, uh, it's important to note that this is roughly about the width of the bark itself, and then that's how the cork is punched out. These these corks are usually machine punched. I mean, originally, of course, they were hand punched, but obviously, right now, mechanization is going to make everything so much more efficient and effective. Um, 
for the sake of, of just moving forward. And then finally, the finished corks are, you know, they're branded, they are treated, uh, sometimes they are treated with a little bit of sulfur dioxide just to completely prevent any kind of um, any bacterial growth or anything that might be coming in there, any, any additional um, prevention for any kind of fungus or mold that might be in there. Hopefully by this time it should all be gone. And then ultimately they're stored in large plastic bags with little aeration holes because they need to be kind of, you know, constantly, constantly dried out and make sure that there's no residual, uh, any kind of um, moisture or anything captured within there. So uh, sometimes they're coated with a little bit of like paraffin or something to make them easier to stick into the bottle. But for the most part, it's all very, very sort of minute treatments to that. Um, and then corks again, this is super interesting. In addition to the corkscrew being necessary for actually re removing cork out of there, uh, that is uh, also what led to the cylindrical shape of the cork because when cork was first being used, it was, you know, tapered. So we still have those cork stoppers, right? You probably, everyone has like one of those really wide mouth glass jars and you kind of have just like an easy kind of big cork and it fits in there because it's tapered so that when you stick it in, easy to go in, easy to pull out. Not super efficient for long-term storage of wine, of course, because the easier it can fall out, you know, the less, uh, the less suited it is for holding the wine in. And interestingly enough too, when we talk about cork itself, the length of the cork, the sort of this part is directly, uh, is directly relevant to how effective it is at protecting the wine. So, you know, sometimes if you have a shorter cork, that is meant for wines that are not meant to be aged. The longer the cork, the more integrity they're assuming that wine is gonna have over time. So that's important to remember. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I think this is pretty much a standard length, but they can come in, they, I think they go up to like 60 millimeters or something like that. It's kind of crazy uh, for some Barolos. These even two that I have right here, I mean, they're about maybe like two millimeters different in length, which is super interesting. And I have one uh, and two different sort of materials that we'll talk about um, specifically here. So the cheapest form of cork is the one that I have right here, ironically, which comes out of my Chablis, which is uh, still totally fine, but it's called cork agglomerate. And the cork agglomerate is the one that looks kind of like, you know, uh, lots of little pieces, like the mosaic of cork, kind of all stuck together with a food grade glue, ultimately filled in with a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, filler, like cork filler or cork dust that can go in there to kind of just make sure it's it's really, really tight. If you ever feel these kind of together, you know, they have a different kind of spring and a different elasticity, but both are very functional. Again, usually uh, the agglomerate corks are, are, again, the least expensive. And these uh, developed in 1891, so early on, they really, really... <laughs> made a uh, an effort for that. But, uh, you know, it's important to know that the um, the agglomerate cork is, is usually more commonly used for wines that are not meant to be aged, that are meant to be drunk youthful and young. Um, the technical cork is interesting. Uh, it's, again, the cork flower is mixed with synthetic components and then just like the agglomerate, but you actually have sort of a layer on the top and bottom of real cork, so a thin layer. In this picture that's on here, you can kind of see that one that's right next to the, the uh, box. You can see there's like these layers of like full on cork. This actually helps kind of make it a little bit more, um, it, it's sort of, it's like the middle road, right? It's between your regular cork and your agglomerate cork in terms of functionality, functionality and longevity. So that's kind of your technical cork, which is a very, very popular substitute for regular cork because, you know, cork can get expensive. And I know it sounds kind of crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't sound expensive, but like your basic, basic cork can be about 10 cents. Um, and your nicer corks can be upwards of like 50 cents. And then even more than that, I was looking up some different corks and they're graded in eight levels. And the top grade one, I just found uh, like a listing for, you know, a thousand, a thousand grade, uh, grade one floor corks for uh, $885, which is essentially 88 cents a cork. So when you start getting into thousands and thousands and thousands of cases being produced that you then have to get, pay 88 cents a cork, I mean, that is a margin that uh, adds, adds up quite exceptionally. Yeah, Roger, it, like, yeah, you can totally see that. It, it, I actually, I think, yeah, the bottles, I'm not even sure how expensive a bottle is, but getting upwards of 88 cents towards a dollar, yeah, you're getting close, if not uh, surpassing the amount of the bottle. Uh, yeah, it could end up adding about three to five, five dollars per bottle. These, I mean, it's just incredible how, how significant that can be. And of course, when your margins are low as it is, you know, that's a huge, huge amount of um, money to kind of take in as well.
Um, talking about our alternate closures now, of course, our synthetic closures or plastic corks. So this is kind of the picture that I have right there on the bottom right. You know, these are synthetic materials, fully synthetic. They have no, um, they have, you know, they have, they're functional. They totally do the same job. They are, you know, they give the satisfaction of like pulling something out of the bottle, but without the expense of a cork itself, even the agglomerate cork. But you know, they're not biodegradable. That being said, there are people who are making bio, they're trying to do that. But ultimately, it's very, very difficult actually uh, to find a plastic substitute that has significantly similar properties to cork itself to make it that kind of airtight and flexible within the bottle. So, uh, you know, they've come a long way for sure. The synthetic cork in your bourbon very likely is going to be kind of similar to that. But one of the things that the synthetic cork doesn't do, or two of the things it doesn't do, one, it doesn't allow that aeration, that very, very sort of minimal aeration that allows for the, exactly, Roger, they don't breathe. <laughs> it doesn't allow for that development in the bottle uh, and giving you that kind of nuance of bottle age. Uh, and it also, though, uh, on the bright side, uh, is um, doesn't cause any sort of cork taint. So when we talk about that, cork taint is really specifically linked to the cork product itself. Um, the Stelv enclosure, of course, everyone's, I hope, favorite. This is your screw cap. Uh, you know, this is uh, specifically designed by and for wine, an aluminum closure. The the pros pros and cons of this pros no cork taint, um, really really uh, well excellent preservation, no ingress of oxygen. Development still happens. It's just at a different scale without that kind of oxidative quality. So you can still get wines developing, but they have a different profile than they would if they were aged under cork. Good to know. Um, the, the controversy really comes in from the fact that you know some people, some producers are just traditional and they prefer the use of cork. There are actually some appellations, uh, Valpolicella Classico actually, they forbid the use of scalp enclosures. So like some get very, very like uh, ardent about their um, dislike of the screw cap. But uh, ultimately it's an extremely functional, extremely convenient closure uh, to use and it is, you know, I mean, it's been around since the 60s. It sort of went through a little peak in the 60s and then kind of fell out of fashion. But once in the late 80s and 90s, especially when there's a, a much larger surge of cork tape due to all the kind of like increase of wine production and wine, uh, I should say advances as well in wine making that was happening throughout the world, cork taint was on the rise. And so the Stelb enclosure, the screw cap became a wonderful alternative to guarantee that there was no cork taint in those bottles when that was a really big problem. You won't see these as much, but every once in a while you see the glass stopper. Um, you know, this is also, you know, it is fairly, it can get expensive <laughs> um, and, and compared to the cork and especially compared to synthetic corks as well, uh, and even to the Stelvin. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I think it's lovely. They're not my favorite. They're actually kind of hard to get out sometimes. Usually there's a little plastic seal in there to help keep it airtight. Again, you're not going to get any oxygen ingress with a glass stopper. It's a super cool stopper. It's a super cool way to close up the bottle, but not. Um, it, it just really depends on the functionality. And again, with the glass, you do have to be careful, still technically breakable. Um, and then finally, this is a, just a fun alternative. You guys know about the Zork. This is, you know, <laughs> um, it's it's new. This is 2010. You've probably seen these on some bottles. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, what's going on here? But there's sort of like this plastic little wrap that you unwrap. It's kind of like between a cork and a screw cap so that ultimately, you know, you unwrap it, it kind of pops off, but it's technically a screw cap. And then you can kind of seal it back in like a T-top. So a T-top like is the closures that you put into the bourbon bottles usually, you know, where it's just sort of pull out stopper, um, not necessarily quite, you don't need to, you don't need a cork screw to pull it all the way out. Um, but you have this kind of flexibility and versatility and ease of opening with the Zork. Yeah, and this was uh, created by an Australian company in 2010. Uh, and they, they say that it does allow for a little bit of oxygen ingress. So I think there's probably some, some still some time to test that out. So talking about cork tape, Cortane is caused by TCA, which is a, it's a it's a compound um, that's actually 246 trichloroanisole. So uh, obviously TCA is a much easier way to reference it and usually how you'll hear it. But um, it's a really it's a particularly offensive odor. <laughs> um, they basically uh, are a product of 
this is where it happens. The fungus and or you know any sort of moisture that's left inside the cork reacts with this compound and it creates within the cork itself, this happens at bottling, um, it creates these sort of volatile aromas, uh, really, really unpleasant that develop within the bottle over time. And it's a challenging because ultimately, you know, uh, they just assume for a long time, oh, we just need to be cleaner, we just need to be better with our cork, but they're still seeing a problem about three to five percent of bottles are getting affected still by cork taint. And while, you know, they're doing their best to reduce that through hygiene, through maintaining those, the, the process of the cork and preventing any kind of moisture or any kind of um, nascent fungi uh, living inside of the corks that they're using, ultimately it still hasn't, the problem still has not been eradicated. Um, the current only, only effective solution is, you know, an alternate closure, including the Stelvin, including the, um, uh, you know, uh, synthetic corks as well. And there is, you know, it's, it's tricky because, you know, cork is just not going to go away, but whenever you have cork, there's always the possibility of cork taint. So how can you spot a corked wine? This is what we're going to finish up with today. So um, when, it, when you have a wine that has been uh, spoiled by cork taint, it's usually referred to as corked or corky, uh, always very fun. Uh, and anyone who's had one is going to recognize this. You have, usually you get a, you know, a swirl and then a whiff and you're like, whoa, that smells super nasty. It smells like mold or wet cardboard or wet dog. It is not the rotten egg smell. That is a separate, separate uh, issue. That's usually a cause of reductiveness of sulfur compounds. Um, sometimes if you smell like a rotten egg kind of smell, it might just be a, a little bit of res a re reductive gases in the bottle itself that will blow off, or it could be completely more integrated into the wine, but that's a separate issue from cork taint. Cork taint is the one that really is, you know, you're, your wet rover uh, slash eating a nasty rained on cardboard. Uh, it's gross and anyone who's smelled it knows what I'm talking about. Um, and it's like, it, it doesn't take a lot. This is the other thing that makes cork taint so, so drastically challenging. You can have varying levels of cork taint. Um, so it might be deeply affected. There might just be a little bit in there and it might smell slightly corky. I know I've used that term before. Um, I'm like, does this smell a little corky to you? And mostly uh, if, it's, if it's not overly wet dog and wet cardboard, what you do notice is definitely this kind of dampening. Um, I was very sad. I had opened up a bottle of sparkling recently and it didn't, it, it was tough because it wasn't necessarily, um, it didn't smell full on wet dog. And it, at the moment I wasn't really sure, but like the, <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Nick is mentioning that the sunset is fantastic right now in Orange County, if you want to take a look. Oh, yes, um, it is. That's great. Bring your wine out there after I, I'm almost done. <laughs> but the idea is that, you know, this sort of this tampered, um, you really don't get, you lose your fruit and you lose your aroma. And on the palate, it just tastes flat and dull. And that's enough, even just a, a tiny bit of cork taint can cause a really drastic uh, reduction in those kind of two things. And ultimately, you know, they will intensify the more that you aerate the wine. So it doesn't go away, it doesn't blow off like the sulfur, it just intensifies. And there's really no way to remove cork taint. Now, that being said, there has been a recent, there was actually just in November of last year, there was a, a sort of article released about how plastic film can remove uh, the cork taint from wine. However, um, to be careful, don't start sticking saran wrap in your corked wine because it doesn't actually work that way. Uh, you do have to, a very, very specific grade of, um, of plastic kind of wrap that the wine needs to stay in contact with that is completely separate from our own saran wrap. So uh, while they're working, they're trying to figure out solutions because obviously no one likes cork taint in their wine. Ultimately, uh, if you have it, you're probably just going to have to dump that wine down the drain. So... That is our, uh, that is that on cork. Uh, and then um, if everyone is not outside or if you are outside, take a look at that sunset make sure we get that in there today because that sounds awesome. Uh, and yeah, is, uh, that's it. So anyone have any questions? <laughs> All right, I have a few questions here. Oh my goodness. So Venka was asking about the Greeks, Romans using cork along with wax since cork tech wasn't where it was today. Was this the predominant way of sealing amphora or some of the other ways you mentioned with cloth more popular? You know, I don't know uh, comparatively how much either one of, I know that all of those were used. And obviously when we're talking about Greeks to Romans to Egyptians, all of them used different ones. The Greeks were just the ones I know for a fact that they had started to talk about it and Romans referred to closing their amphora with cork and pitch. Now I'm going to assume that 
there's probably a, a wide range that was used based on preference even then. Um, in addition to, you know, uh, what else might be used in terms of cloth instead of pitch or cloth and wood to put in there. It might depend like if you had access to cork and pitch. I do not know, you know, obviously the Romans were in Spain. They were in uh, that particular area, so they were able to bring it back. So, but I don't know what kind of access that was, if it was, you know, considered a, uh, a premium item, right? Or if it was readily available. So I think that would have some uh, information to how that would work. Uh, and Rachel, so I've heard that I might have gone too long with a red of the cork color after opening is dark maroon. Is that true? Again, the amount of stainage that's on the cork itself isn't necessarily an indication of what the wine is going to deliver to you once you pour it. So if, I mean, with the exception that if, you know, the wine has actually leaked through the cork, then you're going to likely have an issue with additional oxidation or additional oxygen that has reached the wine. This is not necessarily, uh, you know, presume that the wine has gone bad, but there's a better chance if that's the case. But if you have uh, the a dark, a dark, uh, a dark maroon on your cork, I that's that's that doesn't necessarily one way or the other indicate because it can it can depend on the grape. It depends on what the wine is, right? Because especially highly extracted wines can stain corks more deeply. The type of cork that you have will have a different kind of exposure to the wine itself, it might be more resilient or more, more resistant to uh, gaining that color in there, depending on whether or not it's a composite or whether or not it is a pure cork. And of course, if it's synthetic, you're not gonna know either way, right? Teresa saying you opened a Prosecco that was cloudy and smelled horrid. Is this due to cork taint? Um, oh, by the way, High Times took the bottles back for a refund. Yeah, no, so here's a couple things to know. Um, a cloudy Prosecco that smelled horrid. I'm not sure if that was cork taint, but I'm very sorry that you had to handle that. Um, <laughs> I wonder if it was, uh, if it might, it sounds, it's interesting that it was cloudy because that leads me to think that potentially maybe it was like a natural wine, a natural Prosecco, I don't know. Um, some sort of method ancestral, but I don't know for sure. I would probably have to look at it, Therese, but it potentially it could have been cork taint. But it's a really good thing to note too. If you, if you ever come across a bottle that has cork taint, um, you can bring it back to where you bought it. Uh, it is really, it goes back all the way to the producer. You know, um, so you bring it back to the wine shop, the wine shop gives it back to their distributor, the distributor, the distributor ends up and ultimately getting credited through the, uh, the producer themselves because this is a problem that goes back to the original bottling. Um, so they do take responsibility for that. Just don't dump out the wine, put that cork back in, bring, the, bring whatever's left in the bottle um, back to where you got it and they, they should uh, refund you and or give you a substitute as well. So that's part of the, the process as well. Um, resealing with vacuum stoppers is what John is asking about. So vacuum stoppers, part of what that does, obviously made out of plastic, those are great. They're not going to, uh, <laughs> they're not gonna have that kind of exposure to cork. These are, these are uh, short-term solutions, but when you're using a vacuum stopper, you're pulling out, you're basically pumping out oxygen that's gotten into the bottle. So through doing that, you're able to, um, essentially the goal is that by, by sucking out that air, you're also sucking out the oxygen so that you're preventing additional exposure to the wine that's in the bottle. Now, this will be more effective or less effective depending on how much wine is left in the bottle. So if you have just like this much wine in the bottle, you're gonna have to pump a long time to try and get that air out of there. And it's gonna have a lot more air uh, in, in, um, in, re in relationship to the amount of wine. So it's not gonna be as effective. Uh, if you just have a little bit out, it's gonna last longer because it's all about kind of the surface area of the wine, how much wine is in there and how much air is in there as well. So the resealing of the vacuum stopper is great for a couple days solution, not for a long-term solution. I mean, there's really no long-term way to put the genie back in the bottle, if you will. Um, Linda, I think it's starting uh, partially due to availability. Portugal is a long way from Australia. Oh, that's a great point. Nick is, me, Nick is saying too that, um, the fact that cork is is very is probably very very expensive to to get over there. Um, I think that could be a possibility. Uh, Nancy is saying there's a great article. Yes, uh, from Australia that documents a 10 year study on cork versus screw cap. I actually have that. I send that to people who are in my Australia class, but I'll I'll include it with this one. It'll be fun. Uh, it is a really really great article that kind of in introduces you to kind of how much they've done in that. Um, Teresa wasn't natural. <laughs> Okay, it was just a bad bottle of Prosecco. I'm so sorry. Um, all right, uh, anything else? This is great. I love this discussion, you guys. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, good. And hopefully I'm going to see some of you tomorrow for Burgundy. Burgundy starts tomorrow. Bourgogne, I should say, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. And uh, cheers.
Have a wonderful night, everyone. And uh, ta-ta. <laughs> Take care.